Hi everyone. So my apologies again for uh, stopping the last lecture. Uh, I had said before that you may have to watch this one in two parts, so I am actually recording it for you now in two parts because uh, my kids were jumping around upstairs, so I just had to tell them to settle down a little bit. Um, in any case, all is hopefully well now and I'll continue on with the lecture. So this is where we ended off in the last one. And so in terms of type of protein intake that acts to stimulate muscle protein synthesis or improve muscle mass accretion, um, this study from Tang et al. in 2009 looked at different isolated protein sources uh, post one bout of exercise, and they measured the fractional synthesis rate of muscle protein synthesis. So here they looked at whey protein, casein protein and soy protein. Uh, both whey and casein are considered milk-based proteins, so they're animal protein sources. And soy protein is, of course, uh, the plant-based protein from, from the soybean. And again, these are all isolated sources. So what they found was that whey was superior to soy, and soy was better than casein in promoting protein synthesis. Now, importantly, um, there was an equal amount of protein that was ingested um, in all of these different sources. So we call that isonitrogenous. So there's an equal amount of protein digested. So these differences that we're seeing relate to some of the intrinsic properties of these particular uh, protein sources. So what could that be? Well, let's take a look at, at the next slide. And actually, before I go to the next slide, I just want to mention that this was an infographic um, by uh, Asker Yukendrup, uh, My Sports Science. And uh, if, if I haven't mentioned this yet, uh, it's, it would be a good idea if you find this area of research interesting to follow him on Twitter. Uh, he has amazing blogs also that he puts out in relation to sport nutrition. So I suggest that you, uh, you take a look at that. Okay, so why would it be that these different protein sources exert differential effects with respect to uh, stimulating muscle protein synthesis? Well, this may relate to their constituents, okay? So when we look at what they're actually made of, we see here uh, whey, casein, and soy. And again, this is another infographic by Asker Yukendrup uh, at My Sport Science. But we can see here that these different protein sources contain different amounts of total essential amino acids. And remember, it's important for our body to get these essential amino acids because our body doesn't make them. So in order to make new proteins in the body, you need good uh, sources of essential amino acids so that we can make the, uh, the proteins that our body needs. And when you have a protein source that has a high amount of essential amino acids, it is considered of higher quality because you're able to use those amino acids to make proteins. And again, it's the essential ones that our body really requires because the non-essential ones our body can make. So in any case, we see here that whey actually has a higher amount of total essential amino acids compared to both casein and soy protein. And if we break this down even further, we also see um, that some of the essentials uh, are branch chain amino acids, or BCAAs, and this is leucine, isoleucine, and valine. So these are these three over here. And um, these are considered to be the amino acids that actually um, act to stimulate muscle protein synthesis to the greatest degree. So um, leucine in particular is this amino acid that turns on the muscle protein synthetic machinery. So if we consume a protein source that's higher in leucine, uh, then you know, this, this uh, should be one of those proteins that maximally can stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So this is one of the reasons why whey is so popular because um, it does contain, again, a high amount of total essentials and it does contain the highest amount of leucine. So in summary then from this figure, whey as a, um, an isolated protein source has the highest essential amino acid and leucine content of all the proteins. And this is where these data essentially come from. This was a study done in 2018 by uh, Luke Van Loon's group in the Netherlands. But let me ask you this question. So not a lot of people eat isolated protein sources. Yes, they may go to a health food store, um, GNC, whatever, and pick up some uh, 
protein powder, as you can see here, and make protein shakes with it. But most people tend to eat whole foods. So how does this research translate when we talk about um, taking whole foods and consuming whole foods and using the amino acids within these foods? Well, here is, again, another infographic by Asker Yukendrup in this area. And we're going along the same premise here. So what is the best protein source for building muscle? And so now we get into the situation where we're looking at whole food protein sources, and we can look at animal versus plant protein. So these animal protein sources are, for example, beef, eggs, and cheese, and milk, and yogurt, and things like that. And then we have plant protein sources, which are soy, um, uh, potato and pea, um, legume, things like that. So these are our plant protein sources. And how good they are at creating muscle essentially relates to their potential to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And this in turn relates to the types of amino acids that they have, so their amino acid composition. And we already saw in the previous slide that those that contain higher amounts of essential amino acids and higher levels of branch chain amino acids tend to be um, of higher quality and tend to uh, stimulate muscle protein synthesis better. But then we have this other part of, of the equation also, which relates to digestibility of these proteins. And I mentioned in one of the previous lectures that protein digestibility is a key factor in uh, talking about the, the overall quality of the protein. And, you know, we can look at PDCAS or we can look at DIAS in terms of assessing protein quality. And the digestibility of the protein is a big part of that. Okay, and this relates to the idea that these, these plant protein sources may be of lower quality because um, they may contain anti-nutrients like fibers and oxalates and phytates, which actually are contained within their food matrix, um, and they act to impede the digestion and absorption of uh, the nutrients within those particular foods. And also, some plant-based protein sources tend to not be complete, so they don't have a full complement of amino acids. So both of those things together may affect uh, how well a plant protein source can stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So here are some uh, summary points from this infographic. Most animal-based protein sources, including dairy, meat, and eggs, are more digestible than plant protein sources, such as soy, wheat, rice, and potato. And again, this relates to the food matrix and the anti-nutrients and the fiber and other such things that are contained within plant source proteins that are not within animal source proteins. And as a general rule, the leucine content of animal proteins exceeds plant proteins. So we already saw that in the previous slide that both whey and casein have a higher leucine content than, um, than soy. And this, th this is true for many of the other plant-based protein sources in that they tend to have a lower percentage of leucine or branched-chain amino acids compared to the other proteins. Now, there are ways to get around that, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. So how do these whole food protein sources stack up with respect to building muscle in a research setting? So here I have two research studies, and one on the next slide that I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, this first one over here was a 12-week uh, resistance training study that was done by Hartman et al. in 2007. And he uh, fed participants either a control beverage, which was like a maltodextrin carbohydrate-based beverage post-exercise, uh, soy milk post-exercise, or um, skim milk post-exercise. And, and these subjects consumed these drinks um, every time they exercised uh, for, for 12 weeks. And what we see here is that because they were undergoing a resistance training program, we can see that all three groups, the control, soy, and milk, showed an increase from baseline with respect to um, improvements in muscle. So here we can see on the y-axis type 2 muscle fiber cross-sectional area. So this is, you know, as the muscle, the thigh muscle gets bigger, and I think they were measuring the quadricep muscle, as that gets bigger, the cross-sectional area is going to increase. So this is a surrogate measure of hypertrophy of these type 2 fibers. So they saw that with the resistance training program, uh, they all showed increases, which is great. 
Uh, but this, this plus over here, over the milk, is showing that there was a greater increase in uh, type 2 fiber cross-sectional area in those participants who consume milk compared to those who consume soy and control. Um, so in this case, consuming milk post-exercise was better uh, than soy protein. So the animal protein was better than the vegetable protein in increasing lean mass uh, or fiber cross-sectional area. Now, this study over here was more recently done, actually from my lab, and instead of looking at milk, we actually looked at another dairy product. We ended up looking at Greek yogurt, and we measured fat-free mass, as you can see here on the y-axis. And we showed in a, in a similar study, so again, this was a 12-week resistance training program in young males, and so was this one as well. We showed that uh, Greek yogurt actually stimulated greater increases in fat-free mass compared to a placebo pudding, which was, again, our carbohydrate control. So in this study, we didn't have a soy pudding. Um, we just really wanted to see uh, what happens when you consume Greek yogurt post-exercise over an extended period of time. And this has never been done before, so it's really interesting for us to see that we were able to achieve significantly greater increases in fat-free mass in those consuming Greek yogurt compared to those consuming a placebo pudding. Now, interestingly, we know that, um, that Greek yogurt, uh, as a semi-solid food, is actually more of a casein-based food compared to milk, which actually contains more whey than Greek yogurt does. Um, and so it would be interesting at some point to compare Greek yogurt to milk, uh, to, to take a look at uh, that comparison with respect to um, fat-free mass. But in this case, we just looked at Greek yogurt, and we did show that it, it had a, um, a greater change in fat-free mass compared to a carbohydrate control, which was of the same consistency, so like a semi-solid pudding. Uh, this particular study was done just last year, so pretty recently it was published, and they looked at, uh, in, in a similar paradigm, they looked at uh, potato protein isolates. So this one is a plant-based protein source, and um, again, they did uh, three times a week resistance training for a certain period of time. I think this one was actually a two-week study, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in any case, uh, they looked at healthy young women in this study, and as I said, they gave them potato protein isolates, so 25 grams of potato protein twice a day. And so this ends up equaling about 1.6 grams per kilo per day of total protein. So they ended up giving uh, potato protein isolate at this level so that they can say that they were providing these individuals with 1.6 grams per kilo per day, which was the amount of protein that was shown to be most beneficial in the, in the um, Morton meta-analysis, okay? So they, they made sure that they were up at that level um, of consumption. So what did they find with respect to uh, potato protein isolate? Well, they measured at three different points, um, and on the, the uh, uh, y-axis here, they looked at muscle protein synthesis. Um, and, okay, so muscle protein synthesis, they measured at baseline in which uh, there was no exercise done and no supplement given. Then they measured it at rest, which was no exercise but yes supplement, so looking at the effect of the protein. And then they measured a third time um, after exercise. So uh, yes exercise and yes supplement. And just to orient you to what these letters mean above here, so the means that do not share a letter are significantly different within a group. So we can see here that if we look at the potato group, the, the PP, um, at baseline they have this level of muscle protein synthesis, and then when they were provided with the potato protein isolate, this increased. So A is different from B, which means that the potato protein isolate actually increased muscle protein synthesis, and then C is different from B, which is different from A, showing that uh, there was an increase in, like a further significant increase in muscle protein synthesis when potato protein isolate along with exercise um, was done. So with the combination of the two, we see an additive effect, which is what I showed you in a previous slide earlier. So potato protein isolate works. Um, you know, we, we can see this increase. And uh, with respect to control, we see when we're just given a carbohydrate uh, control, 
Um, compared to baseline A and A, there was no significant difference with the consumption of carbohydrate. But with exercise, we see that there's an increase. So in this case, with the carbohydrate control, um, exercise was the only stimulation of increased muscle protein synthesis. But again, I ask this similar question. What would happen if we consumed whole food potatoes? Okay, again, this was potato protein isolate. So they were given um, as a powder, like a soy protein powder or a whey protein powder. This was potato protein powder. Uh, but what happens with whole food potatoes? And we don't have the answer to this yet because that's, uh, this particular study hasn't been done. But I wanted to explore this notion of the whole protein foods a little bit more and talk about it in the context of plant versus animal. So this is a summary table over here. Uh, what is the best protein source for building muscle? And I think what they talk about is this idea of reaching this leucine threshold. So making sure that your protein source or whatever, you consume, whatever you're consuming at a particular time provides your body with three grams of leucine. Um, at one time because that has been shown to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And the truth is here that we can build muscle with many different types of proteins. As long as it contains the adequate amount of essential amino acids that our body requires for this job, and you know, with that, um, they say that you know, it should contain also at least three grams of leucine. If we are able to provide that for our body, regardless of whether it's animal or plant, we should be able to get the job done. And so I have this, this table over here, which has a whole bunch of um, animal and plant protein sources. So rice, soy, pea, potato, wheat are our vegetable sources, and then whey, casein, beef, eggs, and fish are our animal sources. And in terms of a percent leucine of uh, a particular amount, we can see that they vary quite a lot, uh, with whey being one of the highest. And then uh, some of these um, animal-based sources being slightly higher than some of these plant-based sources. You can see here soy protein and even potato protein are, are not too bad in terms of how high they are. They're comparable to some of these other animal protein sources with respect to the percent of leucine. And over here, I've also done the calculation to show you the amount of protein that you would need to consume of these particular foods to get three grams of leucine. And this is a theoretical calculation because, again, keeping in mind that as a whole protein source, when you consume these foods, it's not, you know, it's not true necessarily that you would be digesting all the protein that you get from all of these foods. So you may actually not be getting three grams of leucine, for example, from 38 grams of, of rice. Uh, but in any case, theoretically, using these numbers, this is what it would work out to. So you can see here for whey, 23 grams of whey protein provides you with three grams of leucine, but 45 grams of wheat protein would provide you with the same amount. So you need to eat more of a vegetable protein source to get the same amount of essential amino acids and leucine as you would an animal-based protein source. So again, I come back to this. You certainly can build muscle with consuming many different types of protein. You just need more plant protein, like a greater amount of plant protein to reach this threshold. And I'm not going to get into a big discussion about game changers. Uh, if you haven't seen this documentary on Netflix, um, you may want to, or you may not, not a problem, don't worry about it. The, the, the reason why I'm bringing this up here is that it just shows that there are athletes uh, who are vegan and they do quite well on a vegan diet with respect to just consuming uh, plant-based protein sources and they can build muscle just fine. Yes, it takes a lot of planning, um, but any athlete should be working with a dietitian, which should also help to plan their regimen anyway. Um, but yes, uh, you would likely need to consume more uh, protein um, uh, from these vegetable sources if you are a vegan or vegetarian than you would from animal sources. But in any case, I just want to make the point again that if you are a vegan athlete or you consume vegan uh, foods and protein source foods. Um, you certainly can build muscle. You can certainly do very well in sport. It just may take a little bit more
planning and uh, perhaps a lot of these athletes also consume isolated vegetable sources like potato or soy, which we know uh, also can stimulate protein synthesis quite well. So just to recap and uh, finish this particular lecture and these discussions. Um, okay, so protein to optimize resistance exercise benefits on fat-free mass. Uh, this was mainly from this Morton meta-analysis, which was a great research study for you to take a look at. Uh, they showed that 1.6 grams per kilo per day seems to be the amount of protein that one should consume over the course of their day, normalized to uh, one's body weight, to optimize resistance exercise benefits on fat-free mass. And I don't want it to be lost on you that this is two times the recommended dietary allowance for protein. Now, Remember back from the very first class that I taught you with respect to protein, the RDA is set to prevent deficiencies. It's not to optimize um, adaptations, okay? So, so it is entirely possible that if people want to be of optimal health or the best health, that they would want to consume more than 0.8 grams per kilo per day, but certainly people should not be consuming less than that, okay? Uh, the amount of protein post-exercise, so consumed at one time as one bolus, one drink, one, you know, um, bit of milk or yogurt, whatever the case may be, you should try and aim for around 20 to 30 grams of protein at one particular time, or 0.25 to 0.4 grams per kilo per meal, uh, which would work out to about four to five uh, meals per day to get you at around 1.6 grams per kilo, okay? And this was uh, based on the study that I showed you by uh, Moore et al. in that, you know, there was really no increase in um, muscle protein synthesis when one consumed 40 grams of protein. This was not different from 20 grams of protein. So what they ended up seeing was if you consume more protein, you just end up oxidizing these amino acids more. They're not actually used to make new body proteins, okay? And this, uh, again, goes with the same lines of, you're able to digest a lot of protein. You can take in a ton of protein. You, you can eat three, four steaks at one time, and you can digest the protein, but will your body use those amino acids the way you want them to, to build body proteins, let's say? No, uh, you will only use a finite amount, okay? And so that's why they say around 20 to 30 grams. In terms of optimal timing of protein ingestion, so, you know, consuming protein immediately post-exercise, it certainly can't hurt. So within this anabolic window, um, after you've done some resistance training and after your muscle is primed to receive the amino acids, uh, after, you know, um, it's, it's uh, the blood flow is directed right towards the muscle, it certainly can't hurt to consume some protein at that point. Um, but there's been some position stands put out by the ISSN recently that just cha challenges this notion of the anabolic window. Um, but really the devil's in the details here because they're saying that if you are steady with your protein consumption throughout the day, so consuming four to five meals per day of 0.25 or 0.4 grams per kilo per meal, then you really don't need to focus on consuming protein right after exercise because when your muscle is you know, still primed after your exercise bout, you are going to be eating at some point. So the idea is just to focus on your, you know, your total amount of protein that you consume in the day, spread out throughout the day. You will be hitting your anabolic window. Because remember, I did show you a study, like one of the first studies that I talked about today um, was that you can have an uh, upregulation of muscle protein synthesis for up to 48 hours after your exercise bout. So any protein that you consume within that time is going to be beneficial. So like focusing on immediately consuming protein right after exercise is not as important if you kind of understand the context of where we're going with this. Now, the before the bed bolus, um, or before bed, um, consuming protein, like a slower digested protein, like casein protein before bed, uh, seems to be a interesting strategy. They seem to show that it does help to improve uh, lean mass over the long term. And, and remember I showed you that it's based on this, this theory or this notion 
that uh, if you don't consume protein before you go to bed, you have these eight hours where you know you're you're um, you're uh, in a higher state of loss. Um, let's say so you know your muscle protein breakdown is exceeding your synthesis. However, if you provide protein before bed, then this time. Uh, when you're sleeping, you're actually able to reverse that slightly and have your body in a synthetic um, time frame instead of um, uh, with breakdown. So that's, that's kind of where they're going with this before bed bolus idea. I think more research needs to be done here, but it certainly is interesting. In terms of the type of protein to ingest, so we talked about whey and milk proteins having higher leucine content, being able to better stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So that's been shown in many different studies. However, there are studies coming out now looking at vegetable protein sources and noting that these work quite well as well. Uh, and I put in here, if you eat enough of them. So making sure that with the vegetable protein source that you're consuming enough essential amino acids and that you have enough leucine. Uh, and then some things to think about. Um, and consideration of whole food protein sources versus protein isolates. Most of us eat whole food sources, and so you know, considering uh, those in terms of how much protein we require and um, and uh, what that is doing with respect to improving our muscle mass is something to think about as opposed to protein isolates. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to provide you in the last slide with some additional reading. If you're interested in uh, this particular research area, I've put here a couple studies for you to take a look at. Uh, but you will not be directly tested on this particular material. It is for your interest only. And uh, if you have any questions, just drop me an email. Um, I look forward to chatting with you and I wish you all the best.